The question is unbelievably cruel, and Jesus puts a quick end to any theological debate among the disciples with his nobody sin response. And then he swings into action. And in a moment of lovely gentleness, he takes the man aside and carefully makes a poultice of mud and saliva and spreads it over the man's eyes, lovingly telling him to go wash it off in a nearby pool. Now, one would think that that would have been it. One would think that all of his friends and neighbors would have been slapping the now formally blind man on his back in congratulations, handing him his children, not just to touch, but to see, standing back and watching as he sees his wife, her face more lined than he had remembered, but more beautiful than he could have ever imagined. They would have watched as he ran up and kissed her. One would have thought that the whole town would have rejoiced. But no, the whole place becomes one giant gaper's block. And our temptation is to become gapers too. To look at the town, the religious leaders, and to say to ourselves, we would have never acted like that. And the bad news about this story is that it's not about folk way back then. It's about us. Don't we want to fix the blame on the victims? Don't we get ourselves into a tizzy about something being neat, right, and proper and miss out on the miraculous? Don't we worry when things go wrong and fret when things go right? Sometimes, haven't we tried to do a good deed only to have it spun in such a way that we are only left with the feeling that we should really have left well enough alone? Fact one. The story of the cure takes exactly two verses. The controversy surrounding the cure 39 verses. That's what happens when we want to gape at the gospel rather than participate in it. We don't have a party. We stage a debate. Or even have a knockdown, drag out battle royal. This really is what happens when skepticism begins to creep into the human condition. Instead of giving glory to God, we want to debate on how all of it happened. That is what the rest of the story is about. It's about a man who once was blind, surrounded by a bunch of people blinded by their skepticism. That couldn't have happened. Interview everybody, call in the man's parents, ask the poor guy himself a million questions. Just don't admit that God may be loose and at work in the world. Or worse yet, make the astonishing assumption that it couldn't have been God's doing because it was done at the wrong time and in the wrong place. It was the Sabbath, don't you know? Healings can't take place on the Sabbath. And why would a healing as spectacular as this happen in an out-of-the-way place like ours to such an unknown character as him. Nothing miraculous has ever happened here. Why should it start now? What the formerly blind man might say to us is this. I know to you, it looks like I've had quite a day, and yes, my head is still spinning a little, but all I know is what I know. And what I know is this. This morning, I woke up blind. Some stranger came along and restored my sight. That got me into a theological battle, way over my head. And somehow, someway, I said the wrong thing and got booted out of my worshiping community. But through it all, 
I felt the presence of God in a very real way. He is now able to see things from God's perspective. What I never saw is the pathos in the conclusion of this story. After the healing, Jesus is not mentioned. More than once, observed Dr. Fred B. Craddock, the man may have said to himself, I never asked to be healed. If this is what it means to be the blessed of God, I think I'm willing to relinquish some divine favors. Then Craddock goes on to say, Perhaps no biblical story illustrates so dramatically the truth of repeated experience. A relationship with God does not remove one from, but often places one in the line of fire. But at the very end of the story, Jesus, hearing that the man had once again become ostracized by his community, returns to the man, speaks to him, and reminds him that even amid the craziness that is swirling around him, he belongs to God. And isn't that the word we need to hear too? That amid all the blindness and the meanness of this world, we belong to God. That when things are going great, and when things are going poorly, we belong to God. When we seem to be stranded by the side of the road and nobody seems to be coming to our assistance, we belong to God, and God is there. That even when we are looking at a miracle square in the eye and then questioning whether it is real or not, we belong to God. Some will always suffer from a gaper's block as far as the gospel is concerned. They will look at it, hear it, even experience the power of God in their lives and drive by. That is between them and the Holy Spirit to work out. Our witness need only be like that of the formerly blind man. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Say that, and you will no longer gape at the gospel, but have it embrace you and make you whole in the power of Jesus Christ our Lord.